In our last video, we looked at the vector function cosine of ti plus sine of tj plus sine of t over t k. I was hoping to take a moment to look at the graph of that vector valued function and think about the concepts of limits con and continuity that we talked about with it as an example. And also I thought it'd be nice to take a moment to show you some things that can happen in GeoGebra. So I'm sitting at GeoGebra.org and I'm going to choose the 3D calculator to get started. When GeoGebra loads, I'll see my right-handed coordinate system right here, and it just takes a moment sometimes. And what I realize is that the first octant's actually back here right now, so I always like to spin it around so I'm looking at that first octant kind of coming out towards me in the way that I'm used to. So I have the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and I can confirm those things just by thinking about the right-hand rule. A lot of things you can do in GeoGebra are very intuitive. Like if you wanted to plot a point, you just type in an ordered triple and GeoGebra shows you that point. And then you can kind of spin things around and look at the point 531 in different perspectives. Well, I don't really want to plot a point. I want to graph a vector valued function. But what I'm going to do is treat it like I was plotting a point at first, it's just the point is cosine of t, comma sine of t, comma sine of t over t. So I'm really thinking about the scalar component functions of my vector functions parametric equations here, right? Every point on the curve follows this set of parametric equations. I press enter and GeoGebra interprets what I've typed. It knows that I wanted to plot a curve. And it even guesses at a parameter interval. Eventually, I want to talk about this graph from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, but for now, I'm going to let it be from 0 to 2 pi. I'm going to use my mouse wheel to zoom in on the spiral shape just a little bit. And to make it stand out a little more, I'm going to come up to these three dots and choose settings, change the color, and make the line appear a little more thick. Close the settings window, and now I see my curve standing out just a little bit more. I see that part of it dips below the xy plane. And if we think about it, as we approach zero from the right hand side, the k component's one. So I think my curve starts up here, and then this t increases, spirals down. But if you didn't want to take my word for that, you could actually explore that by plotting a point on the curve. And so I want to introduce a variable to use for t to plot a specific point. I'm going to call that variable b. And if I just type in a b and press enter, GeoGebra gives me a slider. And so now b is controlled by what, wherever I put this slider. I want the starting and stopping points of my slider to match my parameter interval. So I'm going to choose the settings and then changing the slider information to start with a minimum of zero and then a maximum of 2 times pi. And to get a pi in GeoGebra, you can just type pi. And so now my values of b correspond to the values in the parameter interval for t. And now I'm going to tell GeoGebra to plot a point. And that point will be cosine of b, comma sine of b, comma sine of b over b. Right, because to evaluate a point on this using the set parametric equations, I plug in a value and that value is now b. Well, I told you about what to do, and it says, hey, I can't do it. You can't plug zero into this. But what I can do now is change the value of b and examine what happens as I move forward. And the best way of doing that is to hit the play button here, because that's just going to slowly change b from zero to the top value of 2 pi. And what you'll see is the moment b increases from zero, you'll see a point appear near the top of my curve. And now my point spirals down this kind of helix shape, not really a helix. It hits the y-axis here and goes below the xy plane, and then it has to head back up towards the x-axis. And that's where it should stop. One of the things GeoGebra does is now it sends the slider backwards towards zero, so we see our point go back up the curve. I'm going to pause it here because I want my point to stand out just a little more. So I'm going to change the settings. I'll make the point itself be blue. 
And let's change the point size so it's a little larger. And now that point really stands out, and I can make it replay the journey. Going down this curve from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so now I want to think about the curve and where we had this discontinuity, right? If I take the limit as t approaches 0 from the right-hand side, I definitely get 1. That point's not defined on this curve. So what I want to do is I, I kind of want to highlight that for my reader, right? So I'm going to type in a point to be there, 1, 0, 1, right? That point right there. But let's change its settings. And what I'm going to do is make this point just a little bit larger. And I've changed the color of the point so that it'll appear as a whole. So it'll just serve as a reminder that there's not really a point on the graph right there. That my point B, the first point on the graph, is just past that. Now what I'd like to do is examine the rest of the curve if I was to graph from minus 2 pi all the way to 2 pi, remembering that 0 is not in my domain, and that's one of the things this point will help me do. And what I could do is I could come right here and just type in a minus 2 pi. What I want to do instead, so I have a little more control over what's going on, is I'm just going to type in the parametric equations again. And I'm going to change the parameter interval to be from minus 2 pi to 0. And just look at the graph in two pieces. And again, I didn't have to do this. I'm just choosing to do this because now I can kind of highlight the difference between the two things by making one half of it be a different I'm going to go back up to my slider B, and now I'm going to let it start at minus 2 pi. I'm going to take my slider all the way to the left, and I see where my point B is here. And I'm going to now let the slider increase from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, and watch what happens. First, my point slides up the purple half of the graph towards zero. And if I stop right here, this is a moment where we have our discontinuity, right? Because the graph, excuse me, the vector value function is not defined there. There's a hole in that graph. And now the point spirals down the red half exactly the way we saw it happening before. So, if I wanted this graph to be continuous, I would need to assign a value at t equals zero to be right where this point is, which is what we did at the end of the last video. Okay, so we have graphed the vector function we set out to in two halves. If I wanted to make it look like one curve, I could simply change this one to also be red, which I did not successfully do there. Now we've got it. And now it looks like one nice happy curve. And of course, you can turn around and look at it in different projections. If I look down the z axis, I see the unit circle. And I see a point that just look at, looks like it's going around the unit circle because the x and y coordinates are the unit circle. It's always interesting to look down the coordinate axes because that kind of gives us parametric equations to think about in pairs. So I'm having a hard time looking down the x-axis, but I think we understand the basics of what's going on, and then down the y-axis. We just see it kind of going up and down this kind of odd curve. Okay, well, I hope that was informative. Um, GeoGebra is a nice resource. It doesn't mean that we get out of graphing things by hand when we have to, but it should help us kind of inform what we're doing.